Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, will, I will call this regularly uh, scheduled meeting of the Ways and Means Committee to order. Uh, my name is Council Member Abdi Wassam, and I'm the chair of this committee. And uh, joining me on the dais is uh, Council Vice President Jenkins, uh, Vice Chair of the committee, uh, uh, Council uh, Member Fletcher, uh, Council Member Johnson, and Council Member Cunningham. Uh, we are a quorum of the committee and can therefore conduct the committee business. Today on the consent item, we have 19 items for your consideration. Additionally, we have one walk-on item we will be adding to the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda includes, uh, number one, legal settlement claim of Ali Aden. Number two, contract amendment with LOFA Construction Consulting LLC for fire station number 15, reconstruction and remodeling project. And number three is a gift acceptance 2017 fourth quarter report. Number four is a contract with Polaris Industries for use of all-terrain vehicles during Super Bowl events and activities. Number five, contract amendment with Trans Languages LLC for translation and interpretation services. Number six is a grant from the Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education training reimbursement. Number seven, is an amendment with SMG for plain clothes officers. Number eight is a contract with Aspen Psychological Consulting LLC for psychological evaluation services. Number nine is a gift acceptance for the Minneapolis Police Department from Vibrant and Safe, a subsidiary of the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District. Number 10 is a bid for parking ramp condenser unit replacement project. Number 11 is a bid for cleaning of the small diameter sanitary sewer system. Number 12 is a bid for construction of concrete sidewalks, curb, curb and gutter alleys and drive approaches. Number 13 uh, is a Minnesota Department of Health grant for source water protection plan. Number 14 is a contract with Hennepin County uh, sentencing to service STS program for maintenance services. Number 15 is a contract amendment with Thomas and Sons Construction for Seward Bicycle Project. Number 16 is a contract amendment with American Environmental LLC for Storm Sewer Cleaning. Number 17, contract with Hennepin County for Waste Disposal Services. Number 18 is a Mid-City uh, Industrial Reconstruction Project designation, cost estimate and appropriation increase. Number 19, is wages and salaries ordinance. And number 20, which I think you should have on, on, your, on, your, on, your, on, your, on the item, is, uh, is a resolution appropriating funds to regulatory services for repairs related to the Tenant Remedies Act. And we've also been joined by Council Member Palmasano. Uh, so we have a full committee here. Um, I'll move all items for approval. Do any of my colleagues have questions or items they would like to remove for discussion? So I'll open it up to the committee. And Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to pull uh, number eight, the Aspen Psychological Consulting, so that we may move it to the discussion, please. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Any other discussions? Council uh, Vice yeah. President Jenkins. Yes, uh, Chair. I would like to. Um, just ask a question. I don't necessarily want to have move it to discussion, but um, can you just say a little bit more about the um, item number 20, the general appropriations resolution? Yes. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's actually in the in the packet. is a is a resolution uh, to appropriate 160,000 to the regulatory services department from a revolving fund that we have, and basically it's for emergency repairs to rental properties related to the Tenant Remedies Act. So, and, and I'll also like uh, Mr. Nielsen to speak to it. Thank you, Chair Warsami. Uh, Council Member Jenkins, this, yes, this is, um, uh, so a Tenant Remedies Action is a civil lawsuit authorized by state law that uh, the city um, can file as well as tenants or uh, neighborhood related organizations in certain circumstances. The intent of the statute is to um, address outstanding uh, code violations in rental property. And um, it's a flexible statute in that, in that there are a lot of remedies that are provided for in the statute. 
one of which is um, the possible appointment of a property administrator, uh, which is a property manager that would step into the shoes of the landlord who has been either unwilling or unable to make the required repairs that they've been ordered to do and to complete those repairs. And they would have all the powers of, a, of a, uh, the property owner or landlord, so that would include collecting rent. Um, once that those uh, identified code violations are abated, then the administratorship ceases. So the statute in state law contemplates the availability of governmental funds that administrators could use to do this type of work. And the city uh, approximately, gosh, I think, how long, I think it was 2006, if it's referenced in the RCA, um, originally adopted our ordinance uh, to that same effect. And so the theory under the, the fund is that the, the repairs would be done and then we have the ability to assess, assess uh, outlays from that fund and recoup the costs so that the fund would revolve ultimately. Is that any other questions with regards to item number 20? So have we depleted the funds or are they revolving? When do they come back to the fund? I don't know if, if anybody from finance knows the answer or if, or if regulatory services is here. But yes, so ultimately, if you're, if you're recouping those funds through the assessment process and through the property taxes, there is quite a bit of a, a, lag. a lag period. So there is the potential to drain that fund down fairly quickly, depending on how much demand there is for administrators. Uh, again, these administrators would all be appointed through the court, be under the oversight of the housing court referee or the judge. Um, but yes, there is the potential that based on the period of time that the fund would revolve, that you could deplete it fairly quickly if there are substantial repairs involved. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for item number 20? So we have basically uh, 19 items uh, on consent. We, we removed item number eight and we can add it to discussion. And um, any other discussions with regards to our consent items? Seeing none, all those in favor? Um, say aye. 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 Are those opposed, say no. Uh, we have, uh, uh, these matters have been approved and now we're going to go to the discussion item and we will start with item number eight. So item number eight, uh, which council uh, member Cunningham moved to discussion, is a contract with Aspen Psychological Consulting LLC for psychological evaluation services authorizing contract with Aspen Psychological Consulting LLC for pre-placement and fitness for duty evaluation services for the Minneapolis Police Department, MPD, in an amount not to exceed $540,697.45 for the period from January 2018 to December 2021. Um, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Chong, I wanted to, I want, thank you for being here. I wanted to ask just a quick question. Um, we got to ask some policy questions, so now that we're here, I wanted to ask more of fiscal focused questions. So um, based on the current numbers of 100 pre-placement evaluations a year, and then one to five individuals for a fitness for duty psychological evaluation annually. So in the term, in the life of the four year contract, there's gonna be an expected tops 420 folks who are going to be receiving these services. So that shakes out to about $1,300 per person. Is that common? Is that within the typical range of these kind of services or is, is that higher? Um, Chair Warsami, yes. Council Member Cunningham. Um, thank you for the question. Our previous year in our allocated budget, we uh, had 1,300 per person. Um, and so how we budgeted for this year was around that same amount. Um, with the proposal that was provided by Aspen, it was at 1,200 per person. Um, so that would be a savings of 100 per person. Great, thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that we were doing our due diligence, asking about both policy and fiscal questions for the public to make sure that where this money is, is being invested. So thank you so much. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. Uh, any, other any other comments? Uh, Vice President uh, Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Rosami and Ms. Young. I, I had a, a question, um, a comment I made the other day in the Public Safety Committee was concerning um, implicit bias training. And I am I wasn't quite sure if I heard an affirmative on that, but I am asking if 
there is a way to include that in the testing and or um, training that ASPEN does. Chair Wasami, uh, Council Member Jenkins, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think we can say that you know the not one test or two tests is always going to reveal uh, a person's all of their implicit biases, and so of course that's going to require additional conversation to uh, assist in revealing what some of those biases may be. So the uh, scope of services that has been prevented, uh, presented by Aspen would include an oral interview. The results from the um, test that will be administered uh, will compile a generalized data point um, or uh, you know, profile of the candidate for the, the doctor. The doctor then take that information back, sits down with the applicant and asks deeper questions to understand or to try to reveal what biases may exist. Um, and so the tools are there to exist in revealing some of that, but the uh, clinical interview or the oral interview also is in place to ask some deeper questions to, to draw out any other implicit biases that may exist. Um, Chair and Ms. Zhang, are there, are there um, specific implicit bias tests that exist? Um, Chair Warsami, uh, Council Member Jenkins, um, I, in terms of specific tests that are administered uh, for implicit bias, I am aware that there is uh, the Harvard um, implicit bias test that exists. Um, that, however, um, is not a test that is in the scope of services. Council Member. Can it be included? Um, yeah, I will have the conversation with Chief Arredondo and the doctor and, and make that recommendation um, to include those tests um, and I can present the response back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Council Vice President Jenkins and Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did want to point out that um, this past week I've had a number of questions about these psyche valves and I do just want to um, thank uh, both Chief Arredondo and HR staff, um, Ms. Zong, Mr. Champa, for, for meeting with me to discuss my many questions and concerns um, around this. I, I think the things that didn't maybe come out as strongly um, in the, la the last time we spoke about this in the public safety meeting were the questions about um, selecting a vendor that has a deep understanding of procedural justice, who really understands implicit bias training both within themselves as a psychological evaluator, but also in what it is we're trying to create a department around uh, in, in the chief's vision for health and wellness of officers. And um, I, I see this as, as a difference than the way that many cities do, more clearinghouse kinds of psyche valves. Uh, in pre-screening, but really a, a, what I've come to understand is a, a really a new type of relationship, right? Like this augments the chief's understanding of who he selects to hire. Um, and part of this person's work or part of Aspen's work will be to go and speak about the way that we do um, these kinds of pre-screenings and what that means in development of officers out in our community. Um, so some of these didn't come out in the initial public safety meeting and did require a follow-up meeting, but I'm I'm happy to share more with my colleagues and I really appreciate all the time that you spent with me to go over it. I appreciate how involved our chief has been in each and every one of these interviews, uh, unlike has happened in the past. Um, and and it were it was those conversations that make me very comfortable with moving forward here today. So I just wanted to point that out and thank you guys for your time. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask if it would be possible to for you to follow up with me about what the measurables will be around evaluating this contract. I know that's more of a policy question, but um, that's just something that I was hoping that we'd be able to follow up on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, thank you to the staff. Thank you for all the work you've done. And if there are no other questions, I'll move this item for approval. Move. Second. Second. All right. All the ayes. 
Aye. Aye. Uh, no. Uh, this item has been approved. Thank you very much. Now we move to item number 20, which is discussion item and uh, number 20, number 21, and number 22 uh, are all contract uh, amendments. Uh, and we have uh, both City Attorney Susan Trammell and uh, uh, Mr. Jean uh, Renieri here as well. Thank you. And we'll start with number 20. So you can start the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Warsami. Susan Trammell from the City Attorney's Office. I'm here in my role as the Ethics Officer. And these three contracts are before you uh, regarding the engagement of lobbyist services. Mm -hmm. And every time Mr. Ranieri um, seeks to hire through contract lobbyists to assist the city, both at the Minnesota Legislature and at the Congressional Sessions in Washington, D.C., he um, forwards to me his proposed contractors, his proposed vendors. The reason he does that is that the ethics code requires that I then examine all of the principals uh, who will be represented by the lobbyist and the issues upon which the lobbyist is pursuing on their behalf. So they send over to Mr. Ranieri a list of their principals, their clients, in other words, and their issues. And he and I sit down and go through those lists to determine if there are any concerns that we have. Sometimes we note things that we're just not certain about and we follow up then with the proposed contractors. And then once that's completed, that process is completed, I'm required to report through that RCA an ethics officer report about any potential areas of concern. So regarding these three contracts that are before you right now, we have gone through that process. Um, we noted in the FAGRI contract that they represent an entity called 21st Century Privacy. And we uh, have been informed that they are not going to be representing them in the area of net neutrality, but it is an area that we are going to be watching. In addition, um, the same issues come up with Franson and with Fredericks and Byron and their representation respectively of Cable Communication Association and Comcast. And then we also with Comcast have some concerns about small cell towers. And so what happens is that Mr. Ranieri keeps an eye on those topics and required under the code once they enter contract with us, these vendors must keep us up to date as to their clients and the issues upon which they're lobbying. So if those issues come up or some other client we become aware of causes us concern, we would then take action under the contract um, and pursue that and also inform the council of the conflict. Thank and you, any questions? If you'd like more information about the actual uh, areas, uh, Mr. Ranieri is ready to. Yeah. Speak uh, on that. Thank you very much. And let me just read out the, the, the items. So item number 20 is a contract amendment with Faker Baker Daniels Consulting for Federal Representation Services. Number 21 is a contract amendment with Friends in Law and Policy Group LLC for State Legislative Services. And number 22 is a contract amendment with uh, Fredrickson and Byron PA. Uh, Mr. Renier. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Gene Renier, Director of Government Relations for the City. In terms of the financial aspects of these contracts, all of these contracts are one year. Uh, they compared to last year, they are have been reduced at the state level because one, uh, budget constraints, and two, it's a short session. We don't need the folks for a whole year. At the federal level, we've held those folks constant. Last year, we made reductions in both the federal federal uh, contracts. In terms of uh, the reviews, what we do is every week we meet and one formal meeting with all of our state lobbyists during the session. But in, we're in contact daily with them. They too are bound, if they have a new client, they must file with the Campaign Practices Board. And we look at those and we also ask, if you have a new client, we need to know, and they have told us in the past, if a new client comes on board. And that's getting to be more of a rare occurrence uh, as the session proceeds. At the federal level, we, we have conference calls, and we do also re ask for the same information if there's a new client. Any questions? Uh, Vice Chair Fletcher. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Ranieri, uh, just wanted to check in, and I think this uh, this has come up in a previous conversation that you and I have had, but uh, as we're budgeting for federal representation and as the federal government is shut down and seems questionably likely to do anything uh, for us, good or bad, uh, how are you assessing whether it makes sense to continue investing in federal representation in the current session? Mr. Chairman, Councilmember Fletcher, thanks for the question. <laughs> it's something we like to do through the year. We would like to analyze what's happening in 2018, and I am concerned that do we need the capacity we have at the federal level? And I think at the end of this year, we'll make that decision as part of our budget process too. But it's something we're watching because when we started this, we had about $250,000 budgeted for federal representation. We now have it under about 194. Now, what, what is the right number and what, what level do we need is something we need to discuss. Thanks, and does this contract commit us to a minimum level of spending? The contract we're approving today? Mr. Chairman, uh, Council Member Fletcher, it's not to exceed, and I think it's so much per month, and then we have a 30-day termination clause. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, thank you to uh, Susan Trammell and, and Mr. Ranieri. Thank you both for your presentation. And um, if there are no more questions, I'll move this item for approval. Okay. Um, seeing no discussion, all, the, all in favor say aye. 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 All, all those against? Uh, this item has been approved. Thank you very much. Now we move to item number 23, which is the East Side Storage and Maintenance Facility Grant from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization for Enhanced Stormwater Treatment Design and Construction. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Chair, I just want to clarify, when you made the motion, were you uh, moving items 20, 21, and 22? Yes, I was making, yep. That was my, my expectation, or my uh, understanding as well of that. I don't know if we need to revote on that as long as... Kelly? Council Member Warsami, uh, that was my understanding as well. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And, okay, so now we move to item number 23, which is the East Side Storage and Maintenance Facility. A grant from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, um, accepting a, a maximum grant award from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization in an amount not to exceed $550,000 for enhanced site stormwater treatment and education. Is there any staff to talk to this? Good afternoon, Chair Warsami, Council Members. My name is Bob Frittle. I'm Director of Facilities Design and Construction. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with a design team on a project at the East Side Storage and Maintenance Facility located at 27th and University Avenue Northeast for the last year or so. Um, we are um, nearing completion of uh, construction documents and anticipating going out to bid this spring and starting construction uh, during a period that will take uh, a little over a year. Uh, this is a large vehicle storage and maintenance facility. It will have some city offices uh, and uh, fleet maintenance, fueling, uh, large vehicle wash building, salt and sand operations. It's on about a seven acre site. <clears throat> and this grant was uh, an opportunity that was identified by our design team last spring. And at the time was considered to be well under the $250,000 uh, threshold uh, that would have required us to seek approval to uh, uh, solicit the grant. Uh, but uh, as we got into uh, discussions with uh, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization uh, and what they were looking for, uh, it uh, has since been determined that the scope is larger and the total uh, construction cost is estimated to be $550,000. That includes the design cost. Uh, that $550,000 also includes a $100,000 matching grant from Met Council. Uh, neither of these grants has uh, requirements from the city outside design and construction of uh, what will be uh, more or less a demonstration rain garden uh, with an es educational aspect. Uh, very similar in nature to the garden that is at the current uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization headquarters on uh, Marshall Street Northeast, just north of Lowry. Um, 
the purpose of this will be to do enhanced treatment of stormwater on the site uh, up to a 1.1 inch rainfall event uh, over the baseline Mississippi Watershed Management Organization requirements. Uh, it will filter out 60% of the phosphorus and 70% of uh, total suspended solids uh, before it goes into the stormwater system of the city. Um, and uh, we've had the grant language reviewed by the city attorney's office uh, and approved by them. Uh, we also have included now a resolution uh, setting up a uh, fund uh, location and number uh, for these grant funds because uh, we will have to have the work done and then invoice the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization and they will pay uh, those invoices. Uh, their turnaround is expected to be about a month. So, okay. any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Discussion? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Frittle. Uh, I, I just uh, first want to thank you for thinking about water management as part of your site development. I think it's one of the things that gets uh, not enough attention sometimes, and uh, I'm excited to see that. And I know uh, a lot of uh, the people who benefited from the uh, education programs at the Mississippi Watership Management Organization are very enthusiastic about uh, the opportunity to see this happen. Will there be educational opportunities, opportunities to tour and see how you're managing uh, the site as a part of this uh, program? Yes, Councilmember Fletcher, uh, thank you for your question. The um, educational opportunities are part of the grant, uh, and so they'll be designed uh, to both educate the public and the staff on site. Um, this project uh, will also be LEED Gold certified, and as a part of our LEED Gold certification, there will be educational opportunities in general for the, the LEED uh, uh, certification that we have on site. Uh, any more questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Uh, I'll move approval of item 23. Uh, the item has been uh, moved approval, second? Okay, uh, any discussion? As I see, no discussion. The ayes? Aye. Any noes? The item has been approved. Thank you very much. Um, we move to our final discussion item, item number 24, grant from the International Association of Chiefs of Police for Community Collective Healing and Officer Wellness. This is a, an interesting topic. Go ahead. Chair Masami. My name is Wendy Cook and I'm with the police department. I coordinated the application for this grant award. Um, as many of you know, collective healing, collective community healing is working across our communities to respond to recent historic or cultural trauma. We think of officer involved shootings as a major cause of community trauma, but any major event, a devastating weather event, a tornado going through the city, uh, or cultural racism can be a collective trauma event for the community. The current grant award is federally funded through the International Association of Chiefs of Police, or the IECP, and we're one of five demonstration sites that have been selected nationally. And we're working with not only the IECP, but with the NAACP and the Childhood Violent Trauma Center at the Yale School of Medicine. The grant is ultimately supported by the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime. The project is going to seek out approaches to address needs of those in our communities directly impacted by high-profile incidents of violence, such as officer-involved shootings or other violent crime incidents that result in the tensions between the police and the community. We'll work closely with our federal partners and with six local partners in the community and we'll look for ways to um, ease tensions with and within our communities, improve and increase communication with our communities, improve victim-centered response to those victims of, for example, police violence, to promote problem solving between community and law enforcement, and address the health and well-being of officers for resilience to better respond to the community. 
with technical support from our federal partners, we'll develop and implement evidence-based trauma-informed approach to working with the community that promote true engagement. The grant will build on the, upon the work of the um, recast initiative that uh, the city undertook. Um, we will be piggybacking on a lot of that work that was done in the community. Um, specifically, the grant will allow the MPD to continue to expand, expand our procedural justice initiative. They'll be able to fund some unfunded mandates to promote officer resilience and address workplace trauma. The grant will allow the MPD to create and strengthen partnerships and relationships within the community. We will be able to assist in creating victim-centered, trauma-informed, culturally appropriate responses in the community. And we will increase the capacity of the MPD to respond to events and incre increase community trust and healing. The grant is going to be managed by Glenn Burt. Uh, he has been the project manager for our national initiative that we grant that we had in the department. And he's been instrumental in uh, working with the procedural justice initiative that has been underway in the department. And Glenn, uh, Glenn wasn't able to be here today due to a, a medical injury. <laughs> He's definitely our resident expert. Okay. Um, I, I have a, yeah, I have a question. Is this the first time that we received this grant? Yes, uh, Chair Basami, this is the first time we've received this grant. And again, we're one of five nationally that have received this award. Okay. And I have a question about item, uh, sub-item four, which is, the authorizing of non-sworn FTEs for one project coordinator and 0 0.6 administrative assistant. I mean, how long is that for? And for the duration of the grant. Okay. And after that, are we going to be, as a city, are we going to be responsible to continue those FTEs? No, sir. We will not be uh, required to retain those positions. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll open up to my colleagues. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is exciting work. I'm Glad we're uh, taking this up and appreciate uh, the efforts on it and would like to go ahead and move this item, Mr. Okay. Chair. Is there any other discussion? Oh, Council Member Cunningham. Oh, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in, in line with um, Council Member uh, Morsami's comments, do we have a thought or a process, and I know Mr. Bird is not here, um, but to think about um, sustaining this project beyond the grant duration. Council Chair Warsami, uh, Council Member Jenkins, uh, we've actually already met with our training department. We're at the very, very beginning of this whole process. So what this looks like, I couldn't tell you uh, three years from now, but we are incorporating our training department in all the discussions we have so that we can continue this. Uh, as well, Glenn works for our procedural justice unit as well. Mm -hmm. So between our training department and our procedural justice, the idea is to maintain some program and be able to sustain it going forward. Right. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself because we have some new council members? And oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name is Robin McPherson. I'm the finance director for the police department. I apologize. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Um, McPherson? McPherson, yes. McPherson. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. McPherson. Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, ask, I know, like you said, Glenn was not here, but would it be possible, those uh, those outcomes and what you're looking to achieve through this work are really amazing. And um, I would, would just be interested in seeing more um, behind the scenes about how that framework actually will come to life. You know, it's really nice to say that we'll have culturally competent work happening on the ground and for collective healing, but I'm really intrigued. Um, maybe that could be forwarded to our office. I maybe would recommend that actually going maybe to the public Public safety committee um, as a whole, but really being able to see what that framework actually looks like in terms of implementation, that would be greatly appreciated. And I also want to say thank you so much for all your hard work on this. You said you were on the lead on getting this money, so thank you very much. Um, I'd like to answer or uh, just make a comment really briefly. This is a little bit of a different type of grant than what we normally receive. This is really a working hand in hand with not only our partners um, with with Yale and the other groups, but also with the other five locations 
Um, so a lot of it is sharing ideas and really moving forward and trying to be groundbreaking. The idea is what we discover here and what the other groups discover, sharing that information and then actually making that a national-wide program. So a lot of this will be a little bit of learning while we're going. So we're really excited actually about the process. It would be nice to maybe figure out a way that we can have ongoing conversations and check in about that to see how that's developing, these best practices, these frameworks, um, just so that we're able to really keep our finger on the pulse about this work. It is groundbreaking. It's really necessary. It's what the community has been asking for. And so officer wellness is also incredibly important to make sure that folks are resilient in their work. And so um, I know that at least our office is very uh, interested in staying in conversation to learn more about how this work is being implemented and carried out. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know this is in the early phases and we're still figuring out exactly what the partnerships are going to be like with the groups listed here, and there's some excellent nonprofits listed here. As we get to more detail on those relationships, do you feel confident from the early conversations you've had that we have enough community partner buy-in to be able to meet that obligation of the grant? Can you hear, um, Council Member Fletcher? Um, yes, we have um, a lot of community, uh, community contacts, community leaders that we engage with. Um, we're working directly with these particular named partners, but we'll be working with anyone and everyone in the community. Thank you. Any more questions for staff? Thank you very much, both of you. And we have a motion by Council Member Johnson to approve this item. Thank you. Any any further discussion? See, see no discussion. All the ayes? Aye. Aye. Nays? Uh, this item has been approved. Thank you very much. And having concluded the committee's business, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.